please join me. Let's bring him out on stage. Melissa Leong and the incredible Jamie Oliver. Wow. Did you say her Bless name? you. Come on. Wow. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I have goosebumps. <laughs> I have goosebumps. Feel my goosebumps. Yeah, I've got goosebumps. Oh my god. Mum, they've all turned up to see me. Oh. Honestly. <laughs> oh wow. Wow. All right, Sydney. <laughs> and we got people behind us as well. Right, we better sort of do a bit for them as well. Well, I hear that there are two and a half thousand of you beautiful people. That Go on, Sydney. The day outside, the audacity you have to come in here yeah. and spend a couple of hours with us, that's huge. Yeah, because... It... Wow. Thank you so much. We did all right, didn't we? We did OK. I think we could keep our jobs. Maybe. Well, we, we, it depends what we do in the next hour and a half. Oh, my God, no If pressure. we're bloody boring, it's terrible. They'll oh, be leaving. Oh, goodness me. Well... Um, I just wanted to say hello, and I feel so lucky to be here beneath these glorious sails, beneath the incredible, uh, not, not beneath, but inside the incredible Sydney Opera House. Yeah. It's huge. This is usually the part of the conversation where I say, hello, my name is Melissa Leong, and I'm a host and judge on MasterChef Australia. <laughs> However, I have a feeling some of you know there's been a little bit of a shift, and so now I'm very thrilled to say, Hello, my name is Melissa Leong, and I'm thrilled to be host and judge on Dessert Masters. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to find an excuse to get me on the show. Exactly. Oh, I, I will. Be, I've already. It's already. You know. I can make you a panna cotta or oh, something. Excellent. Lemon meringue pie, whatever oh, you oh, fancy. Like a fully wobbly panna yeah, cotta. Very wobbly. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, but of course, you and I know each other through working together on MasterChef. Yep. Uh, and I had an absolute blast when you came on last season and we got to hang out for the week. We did. Little known fact, Jamie Oliver will be the first person to laugh at a fart joke. Um, and beyond. And Yes, exactly. And I think that's a, <laughs> a lovely childish way to segue into, I want to ask you a question, which is, can I share with you a little story about me and the Sydney Opera House? Go for it. So the very first time I... Uh, was on the bill here at Sydney Opera House was for a Suzuki classical piano recital. I was 12. You haven't told me. Do you play the piano? I play the piano. For the well, love I of God, you never told me that. Yeah. I've got a Steinway in my, oh. in my dressing room. Roll it on, roll it on you through. You are so coming back to oh, my dressing room. Yeah. Give me some of that. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll do some beatbox. <laughs> It'd be great. So I was 12. And here, you were here at here, 12. Now at you're 12. showing off. Now, I don't, say, I don't say that's a mad flex, but I say that because I was reflecting on that moment. And if I told 12-year-old me that I would be sitting on a stage with a globally beloved icon, legend, as Chip said, legitimate legend, she would not have believed me. Well, she would not have believed me. It is an absolute honour to have you here. My daughter's sitting there going, well, I don't believe you either. <laughs> He's my dad, he ain't that special. So, Jamie, you know, you've achieved a couple of things since you were 12, and we're going to be talking about them today. We're going to be discussing your childhood, how that's impacted your career, your life, your family, your activism work as well. Is it odd to be sitting here in a room full of two and a half thousand beautiful Australians? Yeah. yeah. On the other side I of, love it. On the other side of the world from where you no, grew it's up, beautiful. talking about your life. Is that odd? Well, I, I hope that you haven't wasted your afternoon. I mean, like, the, <laughs> I, the idea is that we can have a little chat and we can fill you up with a little bit of inspiration and excitement. And I, I've told you no holes barred. No so, holes barred. So, like, you know... And you get, you get to ask questions yourself later, so get amongst it. Nothing's off the table, so keep that in mind for later. A little secret as well for you guys, a little tip, is that Jamie is a very bad liar. No, I can't lie. So if you have a probing question, yeah. get it ready now, and, um, and we'll be able to help. Yeah, I have a tell. A tell. Yeah, just yeah. flinch a lot. So. 
So where do we start? Just a lot of wiggling. Well, let's start from the start. All right. I think the thing about today and when I was thinking about the questions that I wanted to ask you was that childhood and being a kid permeates your life and has defined a lot of the choices that you've made. So let's start at the start. Let's talk about you growing up at the Cricketers in Essex. Yep. Your parents owned a pub. What was that like? Amazing. So I grew up in a pub in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was just normal for me, little uh, Essex country village. Um, and I lived in the pub upstairs. It was brilliant. I love that you say that because you go, oh, just, you know, just in the middle of nowhere, country. I'm like, and it, I bet you, like, we live in Australia, so that bucolic, green, verdant, romantic English <laughs> countryside that you speak of. Well, that's what it was like. Yeah, I mean, I think the interest, more interestingly for my parents, actually, I was born in a very, very rough estate in the roughest, one of the roughest estates in Britain. So that's where I was born. Mm. Um, and then when my sister was born, dad had 76 hours to decide on taking on this pub in North Essex, about an hour and a half away. That's all I remember. So I kind of, my roots, you know, my roots are pubs. My granddad ran a pub, my dad ran a pub. So it was sort of in our blood, blood really. But I'm sure you all appreciate a pub, right? And, um, Come but, on. And, you know, what's, well, I think what's really interesting, and we don't think it's interesting, but what is interesting is that pubs are quite unique. They're not, in most countries around the world, they don't have anything like a pub. Like, a bar is not a pub, a restaurant's not a pub, like, a drinking hole's not a pub. Like, a pub is somewhere where everyone is welcome, where they're... It's part of the community. Yeah, it doesn't matter what age you are or what class you are or what job you do. Um, you know, everyone's welcome, and, and for me, that was my sort of real school, because I didn't have a great time at school. So let's talk about school. Let's talk about what it was like going to school, because it wasn't an easy time for you. No, I mean, I loved school. It was like a giant... Um, uh, it was just like a like youth club, really. We didn't do much work. Um, <laughs> we were very happy, and I think that's the key to good education. Mm. Um, but I didn't do much work. Um, uh, it was like 860 very leery boys in an all-boys school, and um, all we could think about was women. And um, it was just like, and there were none apart from in the sixth form. So there's about 10 girls in the sixth form oh. that had the full love of about 800 wow. boys. And, um, and actually, that's where I met my wife. Uh, Jules went to the sixth form. <laughs> she fancied her odds, um, you know. The, you know, the stats One to 300, I think. Was, yeah. Jules but, is um, actually... She's out the back. Stage, actually. Can we all say hi to Jules? Like, yeah. Give her a huge round of applause for Jules Oliver. Yeah. If Jules was really kind, she'd put her head around the corner there and say, hi. <laughs> she begged me not to do that. She won't. Didn't you, Jules? We are in huge trouble with her when we walk back. Well, to be honest, again. Jules, she turned up at the airport and I didn't even know she was coming. Wow. So she's very scared of flying. So um, she, she made the special effort to surprise me, but then also my daughter that's traveling around Australia. Backpacking. Hello, Poppy. Yeah. So Hello. if there's any spare homes around like, the east coast of Australia, they're <laughs> properly skint. And if you've got a bed, you know. Okay. Should they um, name drop you while Oh, yeah, just give us a DM. Around. Give us a DM yeah. and I'll just build a map. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you can yeah. plan, you know, their ideal trip around Australia. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm very jealous, to be fair. <laughs> so let's talk about um, I'm Asian, so academics are quite important. Doing well at school is quite important. Mm. My mum's out in the audience. Hi, mum. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, how did you go with the academic part of school? Uh, school just didn't talk to me. Conventional learning didn't talk to me. Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't, I was dyslexic, I couldn't read very well, I couldn't write very well, I couldn't spell. Um, maths was a nightmare, I was in the bottom group for everything. We used to go to a very um, special class called Special Needs. Um, and, um, I don't and, think they're allowed And when you tell young people anymore. now, they go, you can't say that, you can't say that. I went, what do you mean I can't say that? That was my bloody school. Um, and not only did I go to Special Needs, you'd be, they didn't just send you to Special Needs, they put it halfway through a normal class. So you'd be right. like 20 minutes in and it'd be like... Can we have Jamie for special needs, please? Oh. And you imagine 30 boys and no women anywhere within 100 miles, and it's just like the grief that you got. So it was, um, but I was fine with it. Um, yeah. I, well, I was about to say, you know, um, you, you are a very happy-go-lucky person, but something like that, you know, all jokes aside, could really um, yeah. 
damage a person, it can really kind of cause a little bit of childhood trauma. And, and I see that. Feeling that. Yeah, that. Um, is there any part of you that kind of went, oh, that kind of that kind of hurts? No, nah, because the thing is, and so it goes two ways, right? Nah. Uh, no. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a, on a serious note, like, so the reason it's really important is because I was probably uh, more lucky and more unique in the sense that I'd started cooking from the age of like eight, ten for mm. pocket money. And I already knew that I had like the tools I needed to always have a job. And, that there, and I understood at that very, you know, at 13, 14, I knew that I'd always have a job. I knew I had common sense. I knew I could cook. Mm. And, um, that's rare. So Partly because I was working underage and it was illegal, but my dad didn't care. <laughs> you know, my dad didn't care about the law of what age you should employ people. <laughs> Bring them all in, cheaper and younger the better. Um, but, um, um, Again, I don't was, think we can say that no, anymore parents used, <laughs> Listen, look, parents used to literally, if you had a little shy child that couldn't talk and had no confidence, parents would come with that look in their eye, like, I've got one. <laughs> I've got one of those, and literally, like, throw them at my dad. And then in a, within a week of working on the buffet, they're chatty, they get their confidence. But I think confidence is the, the operative word, right? Yeah. So for the other kids, I think it was brutal. Yeah. And, and as I've gone through my career and been in scenarios like this, not as glamorous as this, admittedly, but like as we, you, see, you have little questions from kids that are dyslexic, that yeah. struggle, struggle, struggle. And you've seen that confidence just knocked out of them. And that's the real disgrace of modern day education, I think, really. Mm. So I think we do all learn differently. And, um, but I think everyone's got a place, everyone's got a genius, and, and finding that confidence is really, really important. So for me, it was cooking. Um, I think that's worthy of applause. Yeah, I think, like, you know, it's, I, I've always sort of felt like, what is school? Like, what is the point? Other than getting rid of the kids and getting them out of the house, um, <laughs> it is ultimately to arm Which them is also for future. Kind of vital. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but it is the job of the state and the school is to arm children with um, the curiosity mm. and the ability to teach themselves and to find their inner confidence and not feel, most importantly, that they have to fit in to one size fits all, which seems to be the common trait of most schooling. So, you know. Um, so it's about sort of finding that way of um, learning that speaks to you, or if yeah. a kid going through that. And it's, it's not that one's better than the other, it's just that we're all different, and every one of us deserves to sort of find our mojo, and particularly with kids. And now I've had five, like every one of my kids has learned at a different rate in a different way, but ultimately, I think finding the confidence to sort of feel like, right, life, let's, we can have a go at this. So, and yeah, I mean, for me, I definitely cooking saved, saved me, for sure. So, boy, did you find your mojo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the cooking, I had a plan, by the way, but it didn't quite work out like this. So, what um, was, talk to me about... So this was never the plan, by the way. How old were you when you had the plan, and what was the plan? So, the plan was, right, I left school at 16, I went to college to train because I could already, the stuff they were teaching I could already do, so I could really focus on the theory side, which was my weak bit. Mm -hmm. So I did well at college, and then I just wanted to move to London and get a job. And me and Jules were already together by then. So I met Jules at 18, mm -hmm. and um, we moved to London at like 19. And I worked for Antonio Coluccio, and then my mentor, Gennaro Contaldo. So we were, just, we were just up for it. We were up for going <laughs> to the city. We were, uh, it, was, it was such an adventure like the big city. We came from like a little village where not much really happened. Although, I say not much really happened, apparently I found out that it's the swinging capital of England. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And any Brits in the room All will be right. like, apparently, apparently the, the code for swinging in Britain um, it Oh, is, God, I'm, everyone take notes. No, well, <laughs> it's not like nowadays where you have like, you know, apps. <laughs> no, no, we didn't have apps. We, we grew pampas grass. Oh, yeah, and if you don't know what that is, it's a very tall plant that pollinates in a very erotic way. And all I'm going to say is my village was full of pampas grass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of fruit bowls and car keys. <laughs> anyway, but as far as I was concerned, nothing happened in my village. Right. This is not quite where the conversation in my yeah. head was going. Well, but sure. Um, 
we, we all believe in value adding, so I hope you learned something there. Yeah. Um, no, there's a lot of people here going, what's pampas grass? Oh, <laughs> Let's get some of that from Amazon. So, as you know, I love the romance of words. I love the romance of storytelling. Talk to me about when you arrived in London, what was the scene like? What did it feel like? What did it sound like? What did it taste like? Uh, it was so different to now. I mean, London is amazing, don't get me wrong, and I'm grateful, and it's a beautiful place. It's got such potential, but like London, when we moved in, was it was the 90s, it was Cool Britannia, like artistically, creatively, which I believe is the foundations of any good city, town, society, civilization, whatever, like music was really diverse. Mm. Like loads of big and small bands, like art was kicking off, you know, Banksy was like, you know, starting his first, well, I used to go to Banksy shows wow. before he was famous and you just turn up at an art exhibition and all the art was just like elephants and rhinos and like, what's all this about? Like, it's, you know, it's like... Before people uh, yeah, jackhammer uh, a uh, wall uh, apart just to get a Banksy off a building. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I got given Banksy's for presents, wow. like, for real, and... and because um, they weren't really worth that much then. And, did, you, uh, did you score any of them, Poppy? No, no? It's just, I actually, um. I got rid of them because I, I didn't want them hanging <laughs> on my wall. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it was very cool. Um, music, arts, um, there was a kind of energy in the air that anything was possible. Um, Blair, was getting his, it, Blair was getting close to his little time, which, you know, politics aside, compared to now, yeah. it, it was a good time. And uh, <laughs> the little laugh over there. Which is, which is uh, sort of saying something, yeah. right? Well, you know, it's, it, was, it was more about the time, really. And I think um, so it was I loved it. an exciting time to be there and to be at the beginning of... Yeah, but I didn't enjoy the time because I was working 20 hours a day, to be fair. But you, you, um, men you mentioned your mentor, Gennaro. And for those of you who follow Jamie on Instagram, which I would imagine would be 100% of you, right? Yeah. And if you don't, please do follow. Yeah, I mean, pl also please like and follow. I'm, I'm here too. Um, hi. <laughs> but you mentioned Nara a lot, and for me, knowing who you are, you, you love to pay credit and, and respect to the people that have led you on your way. Mentors are really important to you. Yeah. For those who aren't familiar with Gennaro Contaldo, talk to me about him. Yeah, well, he's my first boss in London, really. I mean, Antonio was officially my boss, mm. but, like, Gennaro was his right-hand man. And um, on the last day of college, like, the lecturer, the head of year, went, like, where do you want to be in a year? And they went around the class, and it was like, I want to work at the Ritz, I want to work at La Manoir, Cat Cezanne, this Michelin-style restaurant, this Michelin-style restaurant. And I just said, I want to learn how to make the best pasta in London. And like, everyone laughed their heads off like it was a, a stupid answer. Um, I didn't care, as usual. Um, <laughs> but next to me was my mate Marco, who was Italian. And on behalf of Italy, he was very offended about the reaction <laughs> to making the best ravioli and pasta in London. And, and rightly so. And, uh, and he pulled me aside and he just like, wrote it down on a piece of paper and said, you've got, there's two people. One's my dad, but it's in a deli. And then the other one is this guy called Gennaro Contaldo. And I and, like, ripped it off, gave it to me. And I came home that night um, and it's like sliding doors. Like Jules had ripped out an advert for a pastry chef at the Neil Street restaurant. Mm. And Gennaro worked at the Neil Street restaurant. So it was like, on the same time, it's like, oh, that's kind of all right, I'll go for it. But I, I'd grown up like, in my mum and dad's pub. There was like set, six, seven chefs on a shift, a pastry department. Like, we made ice creams, like sorbets, every meringue, French meringue, Italian meringue, all the pastries. Like, I, but I wasn't a pastry chef, so I just had to phone up and lie and said, I am. So <laughs> um, I, was about, I was about to ask And I'm like, you. shit, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I can make French and Swiss and Germanic and British pastry, but I can't do Italian. And I'm like, God, I'll get some books together. So I just did like 10 hours research. You couldn't just, just Google it. Well, it, what you do, what's nice about restaurant job is that you just, we call it a stage. You phone up, you go and do a stage. You work for free for a day. And you just show that you're not like a freak. And like, <laughs> you know, because it doesn't, there's talent. And then there's also, I've got to spend like 16, 18 hours a day with this, like, is, it a, is, is he or she a psycho? Yeah. So, so um, you, you said, I, I, I did not come from a household that grew pampas grass. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, 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 they wouldn't know about that in London. <laughs> London didn't need pampas grass. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, no, it's, but I just did a stars and I said, do you want me to do a couple more days? And that never happened as well. Like, it's funny, like this, 
I do feel, especially with the younger generation, um, like this idea of always being paid, like the most valuable things I've ever learned has been free. Like, free, like me working for free. Like I probably did, in the first five years of my career, at least six months for free. Because you, when you have a job, you have a contract, and you have to turn up, you have to do your job. Mm. But like, if you're talking about progression, which is exposure, like if you do a stage for a day or a week, you do that 10 times. You can do that on your days off if you want. Like in one year, you could experience like 10, 20 restaurants. So like, as far as filling up and finding out who your people are or what your vibe is, or do you know what I mean? So I yeah. think like, like young, I always say to young people, just you don't work there and go and do stages on your yeah. days off here, here, and here. What, what for free? Like yes, for free. And like if you say to your chef, I'll do a few more days for free, then they're like, very oh. Good. And then so I got the job, nonetheless. I think that's an amazing piece of advice for anyone, whether or not they work in food or not, is to volunteer your time. That's your choice to learn things. It's your choice it just your opportunity shows that to grow. It, it just, because what's the currency? It, if the only currency in your life is cash, mm. it's going to be not very fulfilling. Mm. So if it's knowledge or experiences or love or all four things, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. But also, because I was pastry chef, I was the last one out and the first one in. So in those days, I did two shifts plus a voluntary shift. So I, I wanted to just work with Gennaro doing bread. So he started at, three in, he started at two in the morning. So well, and Antonio wouldn't let me work with Gennaro because he was like Yoda. He was like, he was like, like he had all the secrets. And I wanted the secrets. <laughs> so um, so I do my shift, so I'd finish at one in the morning get the last tube back to North London. Honestly, you should have seen the things I saw going back. <laughs> from, from Piccadilly Circus to North London on the last train, Ooh. oh my God. <laughs> and it would always break down at like Cam Camden Town. And it we might need to move things. this session to a 9 p.m. slot. And then yeah. we can talk no, no, we're not going there, but you can imagine, just use your imagination and times it by three. <laughs> but, um, no, I used to then go back at 3 in the morning and do that until 7.30. Yeah. So I wasn't getting much sleep in those days, but it meant that I got to bake with Gennaro. And, um, and he was like just incredible. Like His knowledge and his ability to inspire was extraordinary. And I, I guess one of the beauties is he was my mentor, and then as we get older, it sort of, it, the roles change. So mm -hmm. he looked after me, now I look after him. Yeah. But we love each other, so it's all good. And I never thought that my best mate would be an OAP. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, Gennaro, it's going to be all right. When you've got a bag, I'll change it. We'll get you in there. I'll look after you. I've got your back. It's fine. You're, mo <laughs> you're moving into my house, mate. It's all going to be good. Oh. Yeah, he's, he knows I'll look after him, so that's the main thing. Oh, that's absolutely incredible. Um, Ruth and Rosie, for yeah. people who don't know who Ruth and Rosie are, and the River Cafe. Yeah. Let's talk about... It's that the River Cafe. Well, life. I just saw that first book, River Cafe Blue. I don't know if any of you lot got it. Um, if you haven't, get on eBay or get down the shops. It's the River Cafe Blue book. It's like 20. Yeah, yes. Shout outs. Mm. Yes. Hello. But it's not like <laughs> what it, it was graphically, visually, it was an extraordinary piece. Like nothing had been like that before. And I opened it and like my heart started to race and I'm like I've got to go there so I handed my notice in the next day I phoned up Ruth at Rose got an interview the River Cafe is very cool very minimalist like the husband of Ruthie was R Sir Richard Rogers who designed the Pompidou Centre and like the Lloyds building and he was like an icon everything was clean lines and cool and graphic and glass and metal and I and, and everyone that works there is very cool and they wear a lot of linen and um <laughs> I turned up, and my dad always said, you've got to wear a posh, you know, you've always got to wear, make an effort, wear, wear a suit, son. And I had the cheapest suit that was so cheap, it was, if you'd have put a match next to it, I would have gone up. <laughs> I'd go, ah, what's that fire? That's Jamie, you boy. And uh, I had the biggest, worst tie ever, and like, I could see everyone taking the piss because it was a bad that suit. Was on fire. But um, I did the interview, and we just started talking about pasta. But actually, I think if I really, it was probably my the beginning of my sort of, I always say I'm the biggest feminist in my family. Like, it was, it was Rose and Rufy were not trained, and they were redefining, like, they were writing two menus a day, every day. And, and like, they would take Michelin star chefs in on the team, and eat them up and spit them out on their terms, because it's their gaff. And it was all about quality, no compromise. But 
it, it sounds flippant, but you have to understand that the restaurant industry is entrenched in protocol and ways of doing things, very French, regimental, very masculine, very hierarchical, and these girls were having none of it. And it was brilliant, and to see it, like, because just, just to be noisy, that means nothing. Yeah. Just to be strong means nothing. But it was all because of no compromise. Yeah. So, There's and a reason yeah, because they just wanted to buy the best gear and do as little to it as possible. Yeah. Like, we had, you'd have the best chefs in the world writing monthly menus, and these girls were doing it twice a day, every day, seven days a week. And I remember the first three weeks working there nearly crying because all of my training had never got me ready to change a menu twice a day, every day. All the prep lists, like all the job lists, getting ready for six o'clock, 12 o'clock service. It's like, ah! But um, these girls, uh, they, they pulled it off. Mm. And because of that, and it's, it's, it's another little, I don't, know, I don't know what I'm supposed to give you today. Like, I've got to work hard to give you something. Christ knows what. But, <laughs> right, but the, point, the point is this, right? Maybe the point of today is my journey might be some thoughtful ways of looking at some of the scenarios in your life. And I'm not saying my way is the only way or anything like that, but there might be another way. That's, now, I find that really interesting. And what, see, as I looked at really good Michelin-style restaurants, they created these craftspeople. And they were quite mechanical, quite rhythmic, right? But they were operators. What the girls did, Rose and Rufy, they, they consistently created thinkers, thinkers that reacted, that were malleable, that would, that would change to the... Not, talk about seasonal, quarterly seasonal, seasons. No, 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 I'm talking about half a day. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's things that come in for season for three weeks. Gold's eggs, sea kale. Like, what was that? Like, well, we had it. Yeah. And as soon as it was up out of the ground, on the menu, like seven hours. So those girls really completely rocked my world. And it's probably the only reason that I've published prolifically. I, I can probably hand a large majority of... They taught me how to think and gave me the confidence to, to take risk and be uncomfortable. And, um, don't, you know, protocol and hierarchy and the ways of doing things is useful. Mm -hmm. And, and it's there for a reason, but they were having none of it because they had this purpose to be on the second. Anyway, I... But that critical thinking thing is really interesting because, of course, it was a fateful day when a television crew walked into yeah. your gaff, well, their gaff, really, and that changed your entire life. I wasn't supposed to be working. Listen, honestly, I was on a promise, and, and like, it was my Saturday night off. Like, they got it in the back. <laughs> They're a bit sharper than you lot. You're like, a promise? What I is this like promise? I feel like we have the naughty kids I'm trying to the feed back. them. It's a family Love show. You. It's 1.30. I'm giving you crumbs. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> uh, I was on a promise, and it was a Saturday night, and me and Jules hadn't had a night off together because she worked at the River Cafe as well. She would come out and tell you if she wanted to. Um, and um, <laughs> um, uh, She's out there going, bastard. Um, Jules is like, um, stop it. Yeah. No, but I was, I was not supposed to be working that night. So um, I, they phoned up and said, look, someone's gone down. We got like 180 on the books tonight. Can you come in? I'm like, yeah, cool. So I was late and it was a tight kitchen. And I said, just get, get going and I'll take over. So the rest is history. It's on that program, which yeah. was, I think, Christmas at the River Cafe or something. So it was never meant to be. That was my moment. I turned up. I did it. And now I, I've been making my own TV shows for like 24 years or whatever. I now know what happened. I now know what happened. There's, there's certain recipes that are hard to shoot, hard to edit, and they're not very frenetic or colourful. So they're, they're, they just don't quite work optimally. Mm. And normally you get one of them in a show, rarely, but they had a couple. And... So the editor had said, get in the restaurant and go and get some energy. And so they were doing that. And then I was on this section called Hots 2, which was pasta, risotto, frito misto, and slow cooks. So um, everything happens in like 45 seconds, a minute. So literally the crew's there and it's in my way. I'll push it out of the way and I'm making little taglatelli, you know, pastas. And so they just got about seven recipes in about three minutes. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so it ended up going in the show. Yeah. And that, that was the moment. And like you said, you can identify that magic that happened, what they saw in you. I don't know what they saw in me, but I was like a young fetus just on TV, just sort of like, <laughs> you know. 
But I think what people said is I had an old person's hand. That looks fun. Yeah. yeah. It was just like a big skeleton with a big pair of lips. <laughs> it was just, honestly, it was like before my face grew into my lips, I used to have big lips. <laughs> Lovely they were. <laughs> You don't sound sad about that at all. Nah, maybe I'll get it back one day. Now, that was yeah. the first te television experience, and now 75 individual television series later. Yeah, it's quite a lot. That's, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. That's worthy of applause, absolutely. <laughs> Starting with The Naked Chef. Yes. Who remembers The Naked Chef? I know you, you lot do, you? perverts. After, yeah, I know you lot. Yeah, The Naked Chef was good. So I'll tell you a bit, a bit about that. So, true story. Um, so The Naked Chef was... Um, uh, so a few things happened after that fateful day. When the, when the show went out on TV, I didn't know I was on it. I was working. So the next day, the phone calls started, and it started off with the manager, who was good at impressions, and he phoned up, pretending to be the BBC, and said, oh, I, I, I saw you on telly last night, you were fantastic. Um, <laughs> like, we think you should make a TV show. And, um, uh, and then I could hear him laughing, and, and on the internal phone call, I could see him over there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, bastard. Um, but then in service, the real phone calls happened. And because of the first phone call, which was a laugh, the real one phoned up, and a geezer called Stephen Serby from BBC Bristol phoned up, and I told him to do terrible things to himself. <laughs> Honestly, I won't say what I did, but it was to do with a broom handle in a certain place. <laughs> and um, I can say it in Italian if you want. Um, but, and, but I, because I, I thought it was at Giles, I went for it. And this poor producer on the phone went, no, no, but, 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 no, I just wanted you to do a pilot and then we could maybe get a commission. And I went, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. I retract everything that I've said. Remove it, and um, <laughs> uh, and then we and then we uh, we hooked up, and um, uh, the Naked Chef originally was working under the title Forking Gorgeous. Um, <laughs> true, true. Do you see what we did there? I learned that in special needs. <laughs> I believe they call it alliteration. It all comes full circle. Yeah, <laughs> got my own back, didn't I? Um, who's laughing now? But um, no. I, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know anything about TV, like nothing. But for some reason, I had the strength of character, I don't know where it came from, to go, if I'm going to do this, I'm doing it on my terms. So I wrote what, what people would call a pitch document. I just wrote one paragraph mm -hmm. saying what I would do on TV if I did it. And the words, stripping down restaurant food to its bare essential. And then they went, ah, stripping bare. Naked. Naked. Yeah, and then yeah. the Naked Chef was born. But I think it was also like light music and art and other things. I think timing, it's not just about the content, it's mm. about the timing. And I think what was happening in Britain at the time, uh, and I'm going to generalise, and, and I presume it might have been happening in Australia as well, because the Naked Chef blew up here as fast, as big as it did back home in the UK. It certainly did. Basically, um, women and men were both working very hard. You know, um, like in the world of, of uh, discrimination and all the right words, you can probably help me. I don't know. Like, like there's, like, basically, the girls were putting in a shift. They were getting home at six, seven, eight o'clock at night. They're knackered. Their feet are hurting. The fellas too. And then all across Britain, right? Maybe Aussie. The fellas would look at their wives or girlfriends, partners, and go, "What's for dinner?" <laughs> and the girls had had enough of it, hadn't you? You'd had enough of it. <laughs> And then on TV was this little fetus with big lips, <laughs> rubbing up a pork loin, and um, you know, saying, and, and "Don't you, go to a restaurant, have a party in your own home. It's pucker." <laughs> and um, and uh, it was. How many but, of you have been waiting to hear Jamie Oliver say pucker? I haven't said pucker in ages. <laughs> But I will say pucker for you tonight in the Sydney Opera House. I'll say pucker for you in the back as well. Yeah. And if we're all good, we'll all say it together. One, two, three. Pucker! Yes. Now, we're filming this for a kids' channel, and I hope that translates. But, um... No, nah, listen, I mean, listen, with The Naked Chef, I was so cutting edge, I couldn't even bother to use the stairs. I, I just s s slide down it. Why step when you can slide? So, um, rules for living. 
But I, in all seriousness, if you look back at why it exploded, it was driven by female journalists and lady magazines just saying, we've had enough. Mm. And it was about getting the boys back in the kitchen. And the first three years, in all seriousness, were quite tricky, because the boys and the men of Britain, it didn't happen in Aussie because I didn't live here, but um, they definitely didn't like me much because they saw me as the competition or the problem. Um, <laughs> and the girls thought I was great because I was basically getting the fellas cooking again. So it took about... Because men sort of learn at a slower pace than women. I don't know if you've worked this one out. But um, <laughs> uh, basically, after about two years, I had to teach the men of Britain that, you know, cooking wasn't for girls. Cooking could get you girls. All right, boys, you get this? Yeah. Um, so, but the first two years was tricky. I got chased, I got roughed up, I got whacked a few times, got called all... I got called terrible things by men in that first two years. But, um, but that, that, I think it was worth it. It was a stratospheric and meteoric rise. For you, as a, as a young gun, you were 24. Yeah, yeah, as a bambino. What was it like to go from, I'm a chef, I love my job, to men chasing you down the street with brooms? Yeah, um, well, it was very weird, but very, it was all part of the excitement of moving to London, and there was a good energy out there, and it felt like we tapped into something that felt like a moment, and I think, looking back now, it was definitely a moment, and I think, but also what was beautiful was getting men back in the kitchen, or to be fair, the word getting them back in the kitchen wasn't true, was it, girls? Getting them in the kitchen, um, <laughs> was, you know, other than the odd barbecue, which you do more out here, but, like, not so much back home. It rains quite a lot. Um, <laughs> but um, it was definitely a moment. And, actually, the men were incredible, because I, like, I went from gigs like this, which would be all women, and then within three years, it would be 50-50. And, and then, like, from that moment onwards, it was beautiful. It was, like, people finding that excitement for food. Like, you know, do we go out on the weekend or do we do something at home, you know? I think that was what it was all about, really. How does it feel to have had a tangible contribution to... Pop culture? Well, ye yes, I suppose, but just the way people choose to, um, to relax and to, to yeah, have I loved vocation, it. As no, to I'm, have I'm, time away from vocation. Yeah, I, just, I just think, like, it's... Like, my, some of my favourite things in the world are, are people, like, views, food, music, like creative people, like this is what life is all about, this is what makes you feel alive and, and, and what I know for a fact, because it's become a, a hobby and a passion of mine, but the, the, the more you pull us, or particularly children, away from mud and filth and growing things and knowing where food comes from, the, the more you pull them away from that, just the iller we get, uh, physically, mentally. So, I, you know, I'm just a massive, I just think it's pretty, like, to have the power to be able to buy a few things, do some stuff to it, and create a delicious dinner is brilliant. But I think when we look at it under the lens of like now, for instance, certainly back home, cost of living. Like, if you're skin and you can't cook, life gets very dark. It certainly does. And if you're skin and you can cook, there's always a way. Mm. And when, as I've traveled around the world being inspired, um, it's never been posh areas. You know, when I've been inspired, it's never been foie gras or fillet steaks. No, 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 no. It's always been people that struggle, that are clever. Humans are clever. Like, when they can cook and they're under pressure, genius things happen. Textures, flavours, deliciousness. Mm. And um, so that's what I'm into. That disconnection... Bless you. <laughs> Beautiful. I feel like you... I know you're a fidgeter. Do you want to get up and wiggle? No, I'm just going to plant my foot under my okay. buttocks. <laughs> that disconnection from food, that disconnection from land, and, and therefore the way especially children see where their nutrition comes from, yeah. that's played quite heavily in... Big time. ..where you've moved yeah. with your platform, with your purpose. Yeah. Well, the purpose is an interesting one. I didn't ever have a purpose. I was never political, and I never had those feelings in my body at all. So I had to... I think people think that... that it's easy to say, oh, yeah, you're born to do that. Yeah, you're just, you're just God-given that. And I, and I disagree profusely. I think, you know, certain things for sure, but everyone can learn everything. And it's just about exposure and try, try, try. And I think, for me, I learned about purpose when I started 15. And 
that was about. Bless you. Thank you. I've actually got one of my graduates, Denzel's in the house today. Where are you, Denzel? Give me some love, Denzel. He'll be over here. He, normally you can hear him anywhere, even here. Um, but uh, one of my ex-grads is here today, living in Australia. Married an Australian girl, bless. Um, We're good. But, um, no, listen, I, when I learned, he thought, he's here today, he thought he learned from me, but I learned from him. Mm. And I think um, these young people, you know, not all of them, but like the point of 15 is you take kids that have had a tough time. You know, some of them were from prison, homeless, struggled, and you give them a second and a third and a fourth chance, love unconditionally, and you fill them up. What happens if you fill them up? Like, and what's beautiful about the food industry, right? And I'll tell you a fact, right? Anyone that makes good food or produce are always 100% good people. Like, like, like if you're good at something, like cheese making, olive oil making, pie making, like these, even if it's at an elite level, they never make an easy dollar, yeah. ever. So it's full of passion, full of like geekiness and nerdiness and dreams of how you can make things better. So I exposed Denzel and the other 480 students, some of which were Australian, you know, I, I exposed them to these passionate people. And those passionate people just changed them. And, and like, if Denzel could talk now, I know he'd say the same thing as I'm saying now, like life changing. When you've gone the wrong direction, and, 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 and for quite a lot of my students, it was often crime and it was nearly always drugs or drug related or bits and pieces, like it was tricky, right? So how do you get, <laughs> some of my students, um, not you Denzel, don't, I'm not gonna talk about you, but some of them, I'm looking over there, I don't you're know You're great, Denzel. No, but like, some of my own. students like, were professional cr criminals, right? So they used to like, say, nick cars five times a day, five days a week. It's like nine to five. <laughs> it's like <laughs> nicking stuff. Um, but if you're making 1,700 quid a week stealing, hmm. and you're going to earn and earn, I don't know, I, I, I paid them at college. I think it was like 200 and something quid a week, which was more than... I didn't get paid anything at college. But like, how do you swap that lifestyle for that? So... But what was amazing is the suppliers and the producers and filling them up was a currency. And, and we graduated over 80% of all of our young people. And after six years, 80% of them were still in the game. Yeah. So obviously, um, that's the best thing I've ever done in my life. So growing up in the pub and starting 15, and 15 was really a metaphor for transformation. Like, and my, it's, it's interesting, like, I love my dad to bits. He's a huge inspiration in my life, like, like very solid character. But our first kind of, like, disagreement was 15, actually, because he didn't understand, like, his kid, like, had done his first book. It had gone to number one in multiple countries. I'd gone from being skint to having dough, mm. and, like, he didn't understand that because he'd never made an easy pound, mm. right? And I didn't make an easy pound because I didn't really make it. Like, you bought a book. And thank you for buying the books. Um, <laughs> and, and even making money out of books is not easy. You make uh, one pound twenty a book. Like you got to yeah. sell a lot of books. Yeah. But it's 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 a really he didn't like fifteen. He thought I was being reckless. And he said you cannot make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And like it was a tricky couple of years because he thought I was damaged. He thought that fifteen was an act of self harm. Do you know what I mean? It, like so. But of course, I was on this journey where these young people were really flourishing. I mean, it was such a change. So that changed me forever. And it made me quite emotional um, about the power of food and um, the power of mentoring and the power of exposure. And also, like, I've made many, many mistakes in my career, particularly in business. But 15 was bang on point. And it was being driven mainly by under 24 year olds. The whole brigade, like 100 of us, were under 24. Wow. And, 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 and only could have done it with some key Aussies as well, by the way. I, I came over here particularly to get Toby Puttock and Matt Skinner, and, um, and together we set up 15, and it was, just, ugh, it was just the best thing ever. Looking at your life, you know, from these seats where our beautiful patrons are sitting, you could be convinced that you have not put, you've barely put a foot wrong in your life. It's a pretty grand life that you've created for yourself. 
but let's talk about failure and how important it's played a, a role in your life. Yeah. Well, I think like you can't really push yourself and, and find out what you're made of or what you're capable of unless you're able to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So like I've kind of worked out. I'm not a, like a super fast learner, but like I tend to. My old, my well, dad. You are a man. Oh what? You are a man. <laughs> True. But I'm quite I'm quite an effeminate man, <laughs> and. Um, or camp, as my kids would say. Um, and uh, I don't mind being camp. I like to pick flowers and lay a table, and I like to care. And I think it's a good, I'm very proud of my campness. Um, but, uh, and I think you should all be more camp, frankly. Um, but, um, but no, I, it's, it's um, that's thrown me off my scent. So you have to <laughs> help, help. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know but failing, about. making mistakes, I mean, yeah, Lord mistakes. knows I've made my fair share of them and every single one of them has led me to today and I can't be sorry about that, I have to say, being surrounded by you all and sitting next to you. Mistakes are really, really important to make yeah. as long as you can take, you can extract the goodness out and discard the mortification. Yeah, I think life is about you. dusting yourself down and having another go and dusting yeah. yourself down and having another go. And, and after a while, you start realising well, the, the point of this life is to yeah. test us. And like, it's nice when nothing goes wrong, but when nothing goes wrong, like, I know that if I'm too happy, like, everyone's in, in, everyone's in search of this happiness and whenever I've been really, really happy, I haven't really been doing the best that I can do. So I think what I'm trying to say is, if you're marginally unhappy, that's the sweet spot, you know? <laughs> like, like, I know none of you want to be unhappy, and I'm not endorsing unhappiness. Um, but if you're too happy, it's going to be a bit shite. I'm going to put um, that on a T-shirt, so, marginally um, unhappy. Yeah, well, I, but I think there's some truth in that. And I think, like, being uncomfortable means you're exposing yourself to new emotions and new thoughts and hopefully through that and hopefully through making mistakes. So like when I write books, everyone thinks we do, we, do, we write and develop and cook recipes very different to anyone I know. So I build my team differently and like we allow ourselves to make mistakes a lot when the cash, when people are being employed and the time's ticking yeah. and it, you get different things happening. So I think definitely, uh, that's an interesting thing, and I've done my fair share. But in your career, can you identify or share one mortifying mistake that you made that you thought, oh, I've fucked it now? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, often I've done things... Sorry, Mum. I'm yeah. so sorry. You got, you got passionate. Um, now, look, I think um, I, there's quite a few things that I did which were really interesting and creatively quite cool. Um, and we're like just two years too early. Yeah. Uh, that's what, timing. Like, I think timing and tone is number one. Being talented, having a good product, like, like you know, all those other emotions that are important and legit, they don't really mean much unless timing and the tone and timing is perfect. And that's changing all the time. So I think like I've done, like when I opened Recipes, which was like kind of supposed to be like the Apple, the Apple genius store of cooking. So it was like cafe, restaurant, kitchen shop, cookery school, and this way of kind of coming in and batching up your recipes and taking it home. And like we make it easy for you to sort of have a productive, delicious life, but kind of we facilitate, but you still do it. Mm. Like we were probably five, ten years too early on that one. So that, that didn't work. That was quite a lot of money went down the pan. Um, um, but it was very cool, like very cool. Um, and it's to you a funny story. So we had this, it's called Recipes, like graphics, brilliant. We went into um, Clapham, which wasn't very fashionable at the time. It was quite cheap. And um, I got in there. We built this amazing store. Um, it was bright pink, right? Branding's great. It's all about food and learning to cook. And we had the riots in Clapham, right? The riots kicked off. There were thousands of people scrapping and setting things on fire, right? After all the kind of fires had gone down the next morning, out of hundreds of shops, there were two that hadn't been done over. One was Waterstone's bookshop, <laughs> and the other one was Jamie Oliver's recipes. <laughs> everything else had been done over, <laughs> trainers and like, what, you know, phone shops, everything else had been nicked and tea-leafed everywhere. Uh, but my shop was in perfect condition. No one, <laughs> no one was interested in a Magimix or, you know, uh, or, or a lovely, you know, 
Pam that was good, in on, good on induction. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they weren't into cold-pressed olive oil. <laughs> it's like just, oh, dear. There you go. It says a lot, doesn't it, really? It really does. Now, I have, I have a question. I, back, in two, back in 2013, you published a list of banned words oh, in yes. vocabulary. May I share some of them with Please you? Please do. Yeah, I okay. can't actually remember the banned words. Strap yourself in, ladies and gentlemen. So this is just for context. Yeah. Um, these are words that are not to be used across the Jamie Oliver organisation in any publication, books, you know, Christmas calendar or anything like that. Mm, Over okay. to you. First off, moist. <laughs> no, no moist. Gush. No gushing. Encrusted. No. <laughs> Don't use it. Not in a recipe. Now, the next one, I have no idea how this fits into food, but minge. What? Minge. <laughs> and closely followed by her sister, flange. <laughs> then yeah. the last three, stuffed, gash and smeared. <laughs> but fair enough, Australia, fair. right? Yeah. I mean, you know... <laughs> When you're making a spaghetti bolognese, you don't want any of that coming up in the recipe. No, you do Put not. Put your right off. So I need to ask you now, upon reflection ten years later, would you like to add any other words to that list? Yes, rim. Don't use that in the recipe. <laughs> I'm not joking. It's not appropriate. Use another word. Use your imagination. Rub. You're allowed rub. You can rub. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, look, yeah, I know you think it's a laugh. This is on a poster, and it's in the editorial department, just so none of my team let themselves down by me using those words. So it is a real thing. It is very smart, because, of course, like you said, collateral goes all over the world. Yes. And you really don't want no, we to want send people. the wrong message. Or... No. No. We want to keep it wholesome. <laughs> by That's... Jamie Oliver. <laughs> Yeah. Introducing the next book by Jamie Oliver, yeah. Wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> and just you on the cover like this. Yeah. Like this one. Speaking of wholesome things, um, a quote of yours that I love that I wrote down for this, which is, when you are trying to move mountains, you want to need people on your side who want to move them with you. Did I say that? <laughs> did I? You did. Bloody hell, I'm good. You did. <laughs> did I really? You really did. Oh, erratic, but good. I mean, you, you may not remember it, but if, if you did remember it, why, what does that mean to you? OK, so, like, in a mini way. I know, have we got any chefs in the audience today? Yeah, there's a few. I, so... Don't be shy. Nah, they don't talk much, chefs. Um, <laughs> um, no, nah, look, I think when you're building teams, like, when you're... Like, leadership in a team, whether it's 10 or 20, is, like incredibly important and um, you really need them to come with you and really like lasering in on empowering and building and sort of so certainly as a man managing um, ego and also the natural reaction of being frightened that someone near to you is going to get better than you mm. right like like hold them down because I want to be at the so I think like, I had to make a decision very early that you just flow let people flow and be better than you you want everyone to be better than you. so that's that's Amen one thing to that. but in amongst that is the concept of change. So as I started getting more into sort of campaigning and working with governments, and I mean, it, it could be change in a kitchen, or it could be change in a, a business, or it could be change in a government, which is even more frustrating. Um, people hate change until the pain of not changing is worse than change itself, right? Yeah. Now, that is someone else's quote. I don't know who it is, but, um, <laughs> but a vicar, a pastor, said it to me when I was, I was living in the most unhealthy town in America. And I'd gone in there, and I had a plan, and we'd done a load of amazing stuff in the UK, and we steamed into this village, uh, this town, um, Huntington, West Virginia, and within a week, this local radio DJ had made us like public enemy number one. And like a little bit racy, racisty, sort of, you know, like, and everyone wanted me kicked out of that town. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. So uh, I do what every good um, atheist does. Is um, I'm not really an atheist, but um, I, I went to the church and uh, made friends with Pastor Steve. Um, and I started with a congregation and worked from out there. But trying to get my head around how we are not good on change. So yeah. that quote, I think, was trying to say, like, you need to take people with you. 
And yeah. the question is, how do you do that? Mm. So like the force nearly all the time is don't change. And then that quote that Pastor Steve told me was people hate change until the pain of not changing is worse. You know, and that stuck with me because I see it every day in the stuff that we do with child health and government. And um, it's, yeah, like, so what, what I do is story tell. So I'll, I'll have a camp, we'll look at a bit of, so this is a lot of our, my life that you wouldn't know about. So you know the jazz hand side, books and TV, which is, you know, lovely. Um, the other bit of what we do is like, I've, I drive, fund, and I'm passionately obsessed by the anthropological side of us. Well done. And how we move and how we react, and more importantly, child health, yeah. nationally and internationally, and like, what on earth are we doing to our kids? So, um, you know, that's, like, we, we look at where the problem is, and then we try and turn it into a documentary, and then from that documentary, we create a campaign, and then from that campaign, we try and bully government into doing what they should be doing, which is looking after our families. So, it's... Can we, can we talk about what you're doing here with that? Can we talk about the movement and, and what, you're, what you're bringing to and what your hopes are for yeah, look, my the movement's Australian not really anything landscape? That, that, that what I'm trying to do is nothing that you guys wouldn't want. And so it's... Yeah, governments... But it's not about right or left or whatever other flavour you've got going on. It's about, OK, when you're entrusted in a civic place of, of responsibility, like, looking after your people isn't, like, stagnant. It's a moving target. Like, so, like, public health is about how do you protect kids. And right now, our kids are being marketed to, hunted, and, and on their phones and their iPads and their games. Our biggest sporting events is owned by junk food. Yeah. And, like, it's not, I'm not saying don't have your junk food, have it. I, I'm not saying don't have your drink. But, like, if you want to, like... We did a bunch of work in the UK. I take one thing, like energy drinks. Like, if you go to a regular secondary school in the UK, right, you look at there's about a third of kids turning up with an energy drink instead of a breakfast. Right, then you go and talk to the teachers en masse, and you say, right, what's the score? Like, they've gone into teaching. It's not a high-paid job. They get a lot of grief. God bless them, right? They're trying to inspire, like, a bunch of kids like me, right? And if you've got three or four kids on energy drinks in the first three classes of the day, they immediately go from an ideal class A to a B or a C. And I'm like, all right, cool. So what happens over a month and then a term, a year? And, and essentially what they're all saying on mass is that, that B grade kid will go to a C, that C grade kid will go to a D. So that one product is making kids thicker, right? And do less well, less educational attainment. We haven't even got onto lunch, right? But it's so like these energy drinks are so powerful. And, there's, and it says on the back, not for pregnant women or kids, yet they can buy it. So it's just these little things. And so it's not trying to be nanny state. It's just like saying, like, you pay all your tax money. That pays for the teachers. The teachers are saying, screaming, crying, S can someone stop giving these kids that for breakfast? Because it's much better when they don't. Yeah. So that's one story of hundreds. And I guess what I'm passionate about is the world that we live out. How can we make... How can we create a place where you have choice, where we don't take anything away, but there's a few more rules in the game so kids are happier, healthier, more productive, and don't die as early? You know, because ultimately that's the tracking. So, it's, and I know, I know it sounds, I know it's, and I won't be serious for much longer, but I know it sounds serious, but I look at these stats regularly, and what's amazing is just through where someone, through a post, if you've ever worked out how your life insurance is done, it's through your postcode, right? The postcode pretty much knows down to a number of days when you're going to kick the bucket, right? Because mm. not you individually, but over 100,000 people, 10,000 people, bingo, bango, they're all over it like a rash, right? So basically, if you track, you know, kids from poor backgrounds, right, they're, they're dying 7 to 11 years younger. Mm. than their middle-class friends. And their educational attainment tracks with that. The cost to the NHS or whatever your healthcare is, is the same. And they're just... If you look at that as a country, that's what clever people call GDP or, 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 or you know, productivity. Yes. So I, I just think it's nice that we don't 
make our kids ill, <laughs> generally. <laughs> and I also think that uh, when we had the Olympics in Britain, it was the biggest show in the world, the biggest stage in the world. Mm. We had 26,000 journalists from around the world in, in London, and it was owned by Coke and McDonald's, and it ain't right. It's just, it's not right. Mm. So um, that's what all those international journalists learn about our country. <laughs> it's like, so there you go. That's part of what I do. It's strange, but beautiful. And I guess ultimately, after 25 years, it's the bunch of stuff that I do, hopefully, that keeps me in the job. Because I'm very fireable, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm very disposable. I'm only a month away from like, not getting hired again. Well, after 25 years, you know, I've worked with lots of people in food from all around the world. And I think one thing that really strikes me about you is that you are completely unpretentious. You are completely yourself. I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, by the way. Oh, I'll keep going. I love this. Uh, you remember every crew person's name. You remember when you worked with them. You ask about their families. You are such a warm human being, and everybody who meets you knows that it's real because they feel it. How they... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty-five years on stratospheric rise, you have five incredible children, an amazing wife, a beautiful life. How do you do it without losing who you are? Uh, it's very. I, I, we do live a quite a weird life, so the Olivers are quite funny, and we won't do it. But if you ever put a camera in that house, it, honestly, it's like the Adams family. <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it's so funny what we're like, and you know, it's. But I couldn't do it without Jules. Uh, of course, my kids are my inspiration. Um, that's why I get up early every day and don't, you know, I never think about not doing it. Um, but I think also, um, and sincerely, like, like, there's loads of parts. The beautiful thing about food is it can be whatever you want it to be. It's like the gears on a mountain bike, right? You can do a million things with it. It's, there's not one type of cooking. You can do quick, you can do long, you can do emotional, you can do, like, you, you can make food anything, but I, I think the connection that I've had with you guys is really through publishing has, you're my boss. Like, when I think about who my boss is, after Jules, obviously, um, but <laughs> like, if I've got a client that is paying me well to do a gig, right, they are way before them. Like, I, 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 if I have to get fired from that because I look after this lot properly, then do you know what I mean? So I, my job is just to to, to use my platforms, to tell stories, um, to, to listen hard. So I, I don't come up with genius ideas of nothing, I just listen, and I listen to you a lot, and I see like what's annoying you, what you're worried about, what you're scared about, what's getting on your wick, you know. <laughs> and, but that's, well, that's why I, I don't think of like, you know, one pound wonders might sound like, oh, Jamie's come up with a new good idea. That's just because I learned from you that you don't like bloody washing up. Right, so it's very simple, you know. And then, like, uh, I ain't got much time. Thirty-minute meals. No, I haven't got. I haven't got even got that time. Fifteen-minute meals. It's like, <laughs> like oh, it's, it's, but it's true. Yeah. It's like, and like five ingredients. Is, I don't like long shopping lists. It's like, <laughs> Jamie Oliver's superfood. I want to live forever. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know. So it's so the the. And it's not a British audience, it's a global audience. And um, so I, I, and I, but I do believe in, in my, deep in my heart, that um, if you can have a small part of your life where you allow, I, I'll tell you a little story, right? It's, and it's probably got nothing but everything to do with it. Like I, I had, there was a highfalutin mum in LA working hard, you know, like juggling her job and her kids, and she's worried about her kids, her kids eating a little old shy, and like she's like feels the guilt, the guilt, the guilt, the guilt, the guilt, the guilt. Oh, what do I do, Jamie? What am I going to do with my kid? He's eating shy all the time. I got the guilt. So I said, listen, I could give you a load of things you can do with this kid. Just do me one favour. 300 metres away from your house is a farmer's market. You don't, don't buy nothing. Just walk from the top to the bottom once a month for a year and phone me back. Right? And this is just, a, a, an, I, this is just a, a philosophy, an idea, but a metaphor for... She phoned up a year later, well, actually, it wasn't even a year later, it was like six months later, in tears, because I think there's a lot of guilt with being a hard-working mum out there when you're juggling kids. And she was crying because she could see massive progress. And I'm like, OK, tell me. 
And like I said earlier about good producers, right, they're always good people. You walk down that farmer's market and they will pull you in, right? They've got stuff on display. The kids are like that. Yeah, have a little try of that. Have a little try of this. And maybe not the first week, maybe not the second, but eventually we'll get them because good things are good and good people are good and they, and they draw you. And what she was able to do with that kid was start, because if you think about it, it's called marketing. So ki kids aren't born to... Uh, uh, genetics don't say eat nuggets. Genetics don't say eat burger, right? right? That's Jamie's uh, fetus yeah, dance, but by I'm just, the way. Uh, that, just so you, no, but that is, is, that is... That form of creative dance is genetics. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what exposure... It, marketing is exposure. Mm. Marketing is not charity. Marketing works. You spend a quid, you earn a quid, 10, quid, 20, quid, 30, whatever. Right? So what happened by walking through that farmer's market, which is a bit of a metaphor for what I'm trying to say, is exposing slowly but surely the people that you love to food, like purple stuff, green stuff, yellow stuff. You know, you know people get amazed that you can take a bunch of stuff and shred it and dress it, and it's delicious. It's like, well, that's just cooking. <laughs> <laughs> you can do loads. But, but I think that the more we can try, I mean, well, the point I'm trying to say is cooking is dying. It's dying. We've mm. never cooked less than now. And the machine wants you to have solutions, not the knowledge. And it's not a conspiracy theory. I don't care about any of that. What I'm saying, and I believe why you're here today, all of you, the reason you're here is because well, you have, unless you're completely mad, and you, some of you might be, but, like, but the reason you're here today is because I know you love food. And I know you love the feeling of when you cook something and you see someone finish a plate. And, oh, and you know, I, so I'm presuming that's why you're here, right? Otherwise, why are you here? Um, um, so, but also, I'm not trying to, like, talk like we're in a church. It feels like we're in a church. But we, <laughs> but we have to. It's our duty to keep it alive. The pattern is saying that, and I, from all the different jobs that I try and do, and there's many of us trying to do it, and MasterChef is a really good example of that. I mean, that's a brilliant story of transformation. And if, if you look Absolutely. at Andy's story, who was an electrician, and now is a really relevant chef and a great Absolutely. thinker. That, so we have to keep it alive. And, and I think the more we do that, the more fun we have, the happier we are. And <laughs> Now, speaking of why you're here, I know that some of you have some burning questions for... Oh, yeah, go for it. Really let Jamie them rip. Oliver, the only, the one and the only Jamie Oliver. Now, there are some numbers, if you can see at the end of your aisles, where you can head over and, um, and pick up the mic. So if you'd like to... Oh, this is organised. over, you can see... You've even got a, a spotlight. Numbers. I'm going to manage this. I'm going to attempt to manage this. Look at now, this. Now, because Jamie gives such good chat, yeah. we have a little less time, but about 20 minutes. Well, I'll try and do Hi. short answers. Everyone have a bit of a stretch if you'd like to shimmy on over. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. Because I am a word person, there is a huge distinction for me between a question and a statement. <laughs> OK? A little distinction. May I ask for your best short, sharp question? Yeah. For Jamie Oliver. Okay. Okay. Let's. Let, I mean, let's. Why don't we start off with candidate number one? <laughs> Jamie, you've got such an incredible uh, list of friendships for 40 years. You've got uh, Andy the Gas Man. You've got Jimmy. You've got Gennaro, working for you for 25 years. Lou and Ginny and all the team. What's the secret to having such loyalty to people all around you? Bless you. Hi, Ben, by the way. Hi, nice to see you. I've just seen you there. Um, wow. Um, I don't know. I'm very lucky. I've got a um, very loyal team. Um, it's, we're about we're like 150 people back at the ranch. We're about 85% women. Um, I think it's because we're a very maternal thinking business. And we try and be commercial, desperately, but we're really driven by um, purpose, which I know is used a lot these days, because every commercial business is trying to find purpose when they've got none. But, um, <laughs> like, we, 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 Shots fired, we've Jamie. recently become a B Corp, which is a social impact business, which means that every... Thank you. I didn't know people knew about it. Um, 
basically, everyone's going, what's a B Corp? Basically, it's like having the auditor in, but they look at every part of your business and say, why? And what benefit does it have? And it's been amazing for me because everyone's measured on making things better and it saves me a lot of work <laughs> so we like them in but i think having purpose and and treating them well certainly as a, as being a geezer running a business that's mainly got ladies working for it being very flexible and um allowing and wanting them to be great parents first and then me second and that seems to work really well thank you let's go to Number four. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jamie. Maya here. Thank you for the years of inspiration. Thank My you. My question is, ultimate dinner party. Who do you invite and what do you cook them? All right. <laughs> Good Damn. question. Um, well, I think, because a lot of them will be dead, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so it's not me then. Well, well, you can come if you want, but I, I think Elvis has to be there. <laughs> so my, my wife is in love with Elvis, so to make her happy, I would invite Mr. Shaking My Leg, uh, Elvis, uh, but also she happens to, to be standing. in love also with Austin Butler, funny enough. Um, so Elvis is there, Austin Butler's there. That'll be a good start. Um, I'd love, um, you know, um, uh, Muhammad Ali would make me pretty happy. Um, I mean, you might as well put Julius Caesar in there for a laugh. I don't know what he did, but, um, you know, let's get some old ones in there. I mean, Jesus would be quite nice. Um, um, don't hold back. Sure. And then Melissa. So yes. uh, we're good. I mean, I have to say, if you did have Elvis, Jesus and Mohammed at the end of the table, I have to say, if I did a really good Ruby Murray, do you know what I mean? Like, sort of like <laughs> Papa Dom's, a really hot curry, <laughs> you know, something that might repeat on them a little bit. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's get amongst it with that. And um, uh, yes, see what happens. I love it. I love it. Excellent question, Maya. Number three. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for being the biggest inspiration in my life. Um, and. Um, I was just wondering how you stay so passionate and excited and driven through school dinners to sugar tax and all the yeah. things as well. Um, well, it's actually you guys. Um, like, I, if no one turned up, I mean, look, I know it's glamorous going to the Sydney Opera House and like, you put the idea out there. Like, I, I still think that like two people and their dog might turn up. Um, so I, I think, m metaphorically speaking, like, People being into what I do, like, I mean, I do feel that my job is to voice things that you're passionate about and find ways to get around it. And as I'm getting older, I'm finding different ways to do that. And I hope I can carry on being more efficient and do more things that are interesting and more things that are fun. But um, I think it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's every morning when I wake up, I look at my reflection, which isn't quite what it used to be. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and once I've got over the shock of that, um, <laughs> I thought I was 25. Jesus. <laughs> um, I, but I, I also think that, you know, that there's a little bit of truth in, like, it's a choice to be... I mean, I sometimes feel quite low and, and, and exhausted and maybe not so happy, and I, I drag it out every day. Drag it out. And, and I think, you know, to, I, I try and be positive and... and, uh, and with my teams and the productions that we do, try and just be optimistic. I think there's so much importance around optimism and hope, I think, and I try and do that through food. Thank you. I think that's a really excellent point. You know, sometimes you don't feel it, but making a choice to choose that, to choose optimism is, is a really yeah, look, strong I, way to I go know about it's it. I think as the older I've got, like with mental health and all the stuff that we're starting to talk about now, it's like we're all fallible, we're all vulnerable, and, and we all need really good friends, and we, we all need to listen a bit harder. And, you know, I'm constantly having a little chat with myself every night before I go to bed. <laughs> Sometimes I'm giving myself a right old bollock. Um, and, you know, and I'm lucky because I've got Jules, who's got an incredible moral compass, and she keeps me in a good place as well. Now, speaking of friends, our friends down the back here. Oh, yes. Number five. Hello. Who do we have up there? 
Hello. Hello. Jamie. Hello. <laughs> Hello, uh, number five. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you and where are you from? Yeah. Um, overjoyed to be speaking to you today. We've, you've got us out all the way from Arsenal, I have you know. So, thanks for it's having us. Arsenal in London? Yeah. Oh, that's a long old ticket, girl. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, you said that cooking is the way to get girls. So, what oh, is... Oh, 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 it helps. <laughs> I mean, I think it helps, doesn't it, girls? <laughs> yeah, I think it helps. What is that dish you cook when you're in the doghouse or it's a sexy occasion? What's the sexiest dish you've got oh, in your Jules. locker? Jules! <laughs> um, God, I think I'm... Uh, potentially anything with chocolate and coffee. <laughs> so in the new book, Five Ingredients Mediterranean, available now <laughs> in all good bookshops... Give it up! Um, there, is, there is a recipe for just that, um, and it is, it is a chocolate and coffee dessert that I believe, gentlemen, in the house, <laughs> that I believe can solve all problems. <laughs> yes. Noted. And um, you don't need a prescription for it, gentlemen. <laughs> no, you just have to get off your ass and go and make it, and, uh, and maybe you'll get lucky. Um, <laughs> thank you. Available in all good bookstores yeah. shortly. Now, thank you for being patient. Number two. Hi. Hey. Uh, firstly, thank you for liberating us from teaspoons and tablespoons. Thank you. And <laughs> allowing us to be messy in the kitchen. Um, I used to watch The Naked Chef with my mum, and that's how I got into you. Uh, and I remember you used to play drums a lot in yeah. those early days, and I was curious to know what your musical influences are. Oh, bless. Well, I love music and I love musicians, and I'm a frustrated drummer. I was in a band for like 13 years. Um, still play every now and again, but um, influences. I mean, I kind of like everything, like just like cooking. I love like all kinds of music, and I'm constantly trying to find new things that sort of get me going. But, and, and music, weirdly, has become quite a big part of like the programs that we make. So hopefully when you saw The Naked Chef, you thought like, the music was quite cool because it was of the time. I mean, you might not be your thing, but like, it was definitely of that time and that moment. And, um, What's on, yeah. your, um, on your high rotation on your phone when you listen to music? I mean, basically like everything I love is really morbid and depressing. <laughs> and like, I ain't got no space. I mean, all that about loving everything, that is semi-true, apart from <laughs> optimistic stuff really annoys me. Um, so, musically, I like it when it makes me feel like complete, uh, like, completative. What's the Contemplative? word? Contemplative? Yes, like that, that's the You're word. You're welcome, that's what I've done um, I, I do like, Jules likes the pop, uh, and she definitely, she, she loves the music, and you want to see her washing up, the music goes on, and it's incredible, you wouldn't believe it. Um, I'll film it one day and put it on. Um, <laughs> oh, God, no, I'm I, so I, sorry, I like Jules. deeply, I like quite miserable stuff, really. Like? Radiohead. You yeah. know, yeah. Radio Porter's head. head. Huh? Porter's Head. Porter's Head, amazing. Yes. Love it. Um, yeah, sort of all, lots of indie bands, um, you know, certain rap bands. But I kind of got into a bit of classical recently. That kind of makes me feel quite good. But the geezer that did it was ex jungle expert as well. So that was an ah, interesting one. That makes but, um, sense. Don't worry. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. But I like things that make you feel a certain way, yeah. not too happy. No, um. <laughs> you, you need to have some relief. Well, it's from not because I don't like being happy, I do. It's just that I like music that makes me kind of think and dream and torture myself, you know, get, get into it. Everyone's imagining you just sitting, but I think cooking, sitting on the floor cooking in the shower, music, yeah, cooking playing music. <laughs> yeah, no, my happy place is tunes on, cooking, and a little drink on the go. And um, yeah. We knew, we knew, we hoped. Oh, yeah. Hello, yeah. number one. G'day, Jamie. Hello. I'm Josh. I'm a doctor in a small country town in Victoria, and I see a lot of patients who talk about comfort food and comfort eating as being negative for their mental health, and people reach for terrible food when they're stressed. And I'm, I'd love to hear your take on how do we challenge that, reframe it, make it positive? How do we shift people from comfort eating to comfort cooking? Ooh. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. I um, like that. I'll try and answer it. I'm probably going to fail, but I'll try. Um, look, I think c the act of cooking is about um, the tone and timing of your moment. If it's on a Wednesday night, you just got back from work and the kids are kicking off, that's one vibe. If it's at the weekend, you've got a bit more time. But I, I do think that 
different recipes. Let's say batch cooking at the weekend has got a lovely rhythm to it. It's quite, it feels like a ritual. You can put the tunes on and you can use it like therapy. You can use it like a massage. Like you can, and I do, right? So it doesn't have to be just like going hard. Like you can be chilling and taking it easy. And that, that can come across in the flavor, I believe, as well. But I think comfort eating is about being in some kind of variation of emotional things and, and you go to it, which is like any addiction, something that makes you feel better. And as you know, as a doctor, like food can stimulate hormones and, and dopamine and all kinds of responses that make you feel good. Um, but I guess the joy of cooking is that if it's just like, people say, or oh, do you buy burgers? Well, not really, because I make bur burgers. Like if, if you can cook, like you can, so I think like one of the problems if you're talking from a health point of view, is like obesity and diet-related disease is a normal response to an abnormal environment, right? The environment has changed. So if you go back just 50 years, like all the stats that are coming through your office are very, 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 very different. So, um, so we, we haven't really changed. Our knowledge might have depleted, so we need to get that up, which is part of what we're talking about today. But also the environment has changed, which was the other conversation around advertising, hunting kids. Like if the only choice is a bad choice, whether it's a vending machine, a corner shop. Have you been in the hospitals where they got like KFCs and Mackey D's? Like, like, so you're surrounded. So I think um, when I spent two and a half years going around the world to the blue zones where people live the longest, most productive lives, um, basically they were mountains, peninsulas or islands generally where Nestle and Danone had never got to <laughs> yet, right? Generally speaking. So, um, so, so what, how can that be useful to you? Well, you might not be able to change your city or your town, and really the government should be doing that, right? But you can change your home and, uh, and possibly with your community of neighbours. So that is my... Ex uh, that's my trying to answer that question. <laughs> I hope it's useful. <laughs> yeah, bless you. I think there's a, the real, there's a real psychology to um, the science of savouring, and I think that's a really salient point, is sort of if you're drawing out the experience of the aroma, the experience, what you're listening to, you make it multisensorial. Definitely. I think that definitely shifts the, the, the burden of what comfort is yeah. to the process yeah, as well as then enjoying Yeah, comfort doesn't mean bad. Yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah comfort to. is, we love comfort. I mean, come yeah. on, but it's how you, how you savour it, I suppose. I love the way food can make you feel like you've had a hug. Yeah. Or like, just curl up and have a little bowl of that. I love it. <laughs> now, we have just a couple of minutes left, so uh, I think let's go to number five. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Jamie. Thanks Hi. for today. Hello. What's your name? Jill. Hi, darling. Much as I love cooking and, and your books, amongst others, but your books are definitely there, I also very much enjoy going out for a meal occasionally. Listening to how you came through the trade and your efforts in mentoring, how can we be great patrons of a restaurant and support young people coming through the trade? That's a good one, Beautiful damn. question. Um, I think, like, first of all, like, like nursing or teaching, like, chefing gets this weird sort of, um, oh, you don't make loads of money out of it, right? So people don't go into cooking to, to be millionaires or make loads of money. Like, it just doesn't happen. Um, so they do it because they love it. But what's beautiful about the trade of cooking and the service industry is once you've got into it, uh, you never, ever, ever have to be out of work, ever, in your life. You can travel the world. Uh, you can absorb cultures. Uh, you can be part of a team. And at the right time, because there's a lot of people rushing to be head chefs and sous chefs, but around the chef to party level is where all the gold happens, where all the learning happens. And it is the most incredible industry. And once you find that strength, you can, you can set up your own things and make it work for you. And it doesn't mean it's easy, but it's a brilliant, brilliant industry. And what can you do as a patron? Um, be aware and notice the new place opening by a little mum and pups or a little husband wife team or something like a little bit different. I go and have a try, give them feedback and, and um, support them. And I think, you know, little and local is 
the holy grail, really. And there's lots of that around the city. There's amazing restaurants in the city. And, and actually, the Aussies tend to prefer the little and the local, other than a lot of countries that go for sort of bigger groups and franchises and things like that. So I think, you know, I, I think the industry is amazing. And actually, what I've already felt in the last three days in Sydney is I've met a lot more career waiters. Like, that, like it's their job, and they're really proud of it. And my God, you can tell the difference. Like, they're so good. And they make you feel so good and, uh, when they're doing it. And um, it's not just a random thing they're doing for a second. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Now we have one more minute left. And I think we need to go up to number four. I see a lot of this happening. Hi. Hi. My Hello. name is... How, what's your name? M my name is Mila. How old are you, Mia? I'm eight years old. Right. The, OK. No, 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 don't fall. These are the really tricky ones, guys. Don't be eluded. <laughs> this is where it all kicks off. Mia, over to you. My question is, why did you write a children's book? Thank God for that. OK. Oh. <laughs> um, Mia. 15 seconds. Yeah, we've got... Yep. Yeah. Go Can ahead. I answer it? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote a kid's book because I was putting my own kids to bed and their reading got better than mine and they said, stop reading, Dad. Tell me a story out of your head. So I did and I started to record it and in lockdown, um, I was kind of in my 40s, I've tried to make myself do something that I'm uncomfortable with for 15 minutes every day and um, reading and writing still is my idea of hell. And um, I spent four and a half years um, putting the kids' book together. But really, if you read the book, it's kind of an adventure. It's about friendship. It's about overcoming uh, things that are tricky in your life. And it's about um, Mother Nature and a magical world and an horrible witch. Uh, and I loved it. And it's one of the best things I've ever done. And I've just finished the second book. Ooh. And um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And. Uh, it's like, um, for any of the more mature people in the room, it's a bit like the Goonies, um, yes. but with an obsession for a good sandwich. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, and uh, I I'm, I'm actually very proud of myself for doing it, and um, thank you for asking. And actually, yeah, thank you, Mia. Um, I have... I've signed a load of books, including that one, uh, out in the foyer. I don't know where exactly it is, but I've just I've done a whole mob of books. If anyone amazing, wants to find I I feel like you have a very captive audience for that. So I'm very touched, sincerely, that all of you have come out to see me today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank Lots you so love, much guys. for being here. I'm going to do a picture. Oh. Amazing. And the wow. back. And the back. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody.